Welcome back to Think Tech. Um, we're doing business in Hawaii today. We have a special guest from Northern Virginia, and that's um, Dave Ramos. Um, he's the CEO of, uh, Dave, what's your company? It's called Shift Points, Jay. Yes. Shift Points. Okay, Shift Points. Uh, and he's been in large companies and has dealt with management issues in large companies. And we're going to discuss uh, what's happening in McDonald's. And Dave is going to render some advice uh, on alignment, which is a magic term used in corporate management. Uh, so, Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming down. Thank you, Jay. Great to be here. So what happened in McDonald's? Uh, and they lost two of their top guys. And that's got to shake up any organization that size. Um, and uh, can you tell us the story? And you, can you tell us why the loss of these two guys is such a challenge for a corporation like McDonald's? Well, of course, it starts with um, the termination of uh, Steve Easterbrook, who was the McDonald's CEO. And uh, that happened on Friday. And it was the result of a consensual relationship that Easterbrook had with one of the McDonald's employees. And uh, when the board learned of that relationship, they decided uh, that uh, Easterbrook could no longer be the CEO, and he was terminated on Friday. Uh, along with that, the chief people officer also resigned, and a new CEO by the name of Chris Kempchinski uh, was appointed on Monday. And so, obviously, that's a lot of turmoil at the top of a big Fortune 500 company. you got to give him credit, the board, uh, for acting so quickly. Um, and also, I suppose they're sensitive to the... Uh... Um, you know, the, 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 the sexual harassment issue, the relationship issue in, in corporate governance right now is so important since Weinstein. Um, and so I, I guess they jumped right in. That was, is, is that to be admired? Yes, it is. I think that uh, in today's environment, um, and really in any environment, it's just more sensitive today, I think, um, executives in particular are held to a higher standard. And uh, the CEO in particular has to personify the values and beliefs and aspirations of the company. And ultimately, the McDonald's board decided that this relationship, although described as consensual, was unacceptable behavior for the CEO. Yeah, sure. Well, it's interesting. The world, the world has certainly changed about that. And I suppose I, I should ask you, aside from his relationship and the issue that drove the board to do this so quickly and you know, immediately uh, chop right, right on, right on the block. Um, was he a good CEO? Was he doing well for the company? And was the director of people doing well for the company? Well, in fact, um, uh, uh, Easterbrook had been the CEO for about five years, and during that time, the stock doubled. So you could clearly argue that he was doing a very good job as the CEO in terms of the business results, mm -hmm. a, a, a particular as measured by shareholder value. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's other metrics now, and there's other factors that go into how you evaluate the performance of any employee, and especially the CEO. Yeah, that's part of the package now. You can't escape that. And I suppose one no of the doubt. things that must have crossed the mind of the board was, uh, if we let this fester, if we let the press make hay on it, uh, we'll pay a much higher price. So we might as well get it behind us right away. I'm sure that's, that's part of corporate planning when this sort of thing surfaces, no? Well, I think that's right. Swift action is appropriate, um, although it creates a turmoil uh, for the organization in the short term. I think in the long term, it's better to take mm -hmm. swift and decisive action on behalf of the board, and I commend them for mm -hmm. making this decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have a new CEO, um, and he right. steps into a, a bit of a disruption. Um, and we've got to get the, the ship righted, so to speak, everything stabilized, and he's got to do at least as good a job as Easterbrook did. Uh, so we're yes, going to give him some advice today about alignment, uh, alignment being the, well, the operative word, no? Well, that's right. And uh, uh, Kemchinsky has been with the company uh, for about four years. He, he came from the outside, specifically from Kraft. And he uh, was an originally hired to do uh, strategy and innovation work. And for the last several years, was running the U.S. operations. And then, uh, wham, over the weekend, he gets promoted to be uh, the CEO uh, of McDonald's. And so that's obviously a big new opportunity for him. 
especially for someone who's a relative newcomer. Mm -hmm. I mean, McDonald's is a company that's known for having long term em employees, especially at the executive ranks. And so here's this new guy, four years in the business, who's now in charge. So uh, and he's got to take swift action right away. It's an interesting company. I mean, it's global for sure. But a lot of the uh, units that people think uh, McDonald's owns, McDonald's doesn't own. It franchises them and they buy and sell and all that. And the, and the people who own these franchises do very well. So presumably if uh, McDonald's is a partner with the franchisees, um, everybody does well. It's a successful company for sure. That, that's right. And there's about 38,000 McDonald's uh, restaurants around the world. And the vast majority of them are owned by what McDonald's calls owner operators or what we might call franchisees. Mm. And, uh, and McDonald's, so one of the things that uh, Kamchinsky has to do is to build relationship with all those franchisee owner operators. But he's got other stakeholders he's got he's to pull together too. Obviously, the board, the investors, McDonald's has about 210,000 employees, and he has to take action to win over the hearts and minds of those 210,000 employees. And he's got to do so very quickly. This is why the, the challenge of the executive transition is to get off to a great start, really the first 90 days. Honestly, honestly, Dave, don't you think you'd love to be in that position? What a tremendous challenge uh, to have this, uh, this unfold job. in front yeah. of you. <laughs> yeah, what a great job. Um, <laughs> And uh, you got to love McDonald's, though, because you're going to be eating a lot of uh, Big Macs. <laughs> you bet. So uh, alignment, okay, in, in the corporate sense. Uh, let, let's see if we can tell the people what alignment is and why it's important um, in determining uh, management policy. Well, that's right. Uh, it's extremely important. And whether you're a small company with 10 employees or so or a huge company like McDonald's with a couple hundred thousand, the goal is to get everybody in the company going in the same direction, driving in one direction, as we would say. And so we have to uh, build the uh, culture of creating a one company culture where we don't let the various divisions divide us or become siloed. Uh, we have to have a sense of teamwork uh, where we're gonna operate against one plan. And unfortunately, most companies are highly fragmented. Uh, the CEO of Microsoft described his company when he took over as a federation of fiefdoms. Oh, and uh, no. unfortunately, Jay, a lot of companies, that's how they run. Yeah, it's really too bad. And it would be especially threatening to a company like McDonald's because they're, they're all over the world. And there's thousands, as you said, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people involved. Uh, to get them all on the same page is not so easy. Um, not so, so easy, right. Uh, and so, gee, I, you know, and it's so easy. It's actually easy to get them off the same page and get them doing fiefdoms. And that's to be avoided, especially now. I can see, uh, you well, know, that the new, the new CEO has to, has to do this. This is very important. So he wakes up in the morning. Uh, well, make it you. You know, you, you were stepping in his skin here. He wakes up in the morning and he says, how can I get these people on the same page? They're everywhere in the world. They're in different geopolitical situations different economic situation, different markets, different customers, my goodness gracious, how do I get them on the same page? And how important is the McDonald's University in all of this? I know about that. Well, that's right. the very first thing he did was send an email to all 210,000 employees, a two page email that articulated his um, gratitude for be being given the opportunity and the confidence the board bestowed on him in giving him this role. Um, reminding the employees about his own personal story uh, of going to McDonald's as a kid and how much that meant to him and how uh, proud he was to be associated with McDonald's. Uh, he then talked about what uh, he had developed in his prior role, the growth velocity plan, and talked about the importance of getting everybody to work against that plan and work as one team together. And, uh, you know, that was... That was a good first step for him because I think it it allowed him to introduce himself to the entire company with one email. So it's, it's possible. It's start. possible with emails. It's possible with social media to actually have relationships. And of course, you know, you can make it a very distant relationship, or you can make it a, a closer relationship. Uh, here in in Hawaii, there was a, well, there still is a, a national company by the name of Alexander and Baldwin, 
And a fellow named, uh, this is like 20, 30 years ago, Pfeiffer was his name. At the time, uh, Alexander Baldwin had a lot of plantation holdings and a lot, of, um, a lot of people on the payroll, tons of people. And he made it his business to know every single employee. He made it his business to know every wife of every employee, every son and daughter, and every dog and cat. And as a result, they loved him. All of them loved him. <laughs> it's a great example. It's just a little hard to do when you have 210,000 employees. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I think this is, this is the attitude that he needs to project, the attitude of connecting with each person individually, uh, to be able to help each person see their role that they play in the new McDonald's going forward, help them, each of them, connect to the vision that he has and find their own path of success within that vision. Mm -hmm. And his, um, his success is going to come primarily from his ability to get all 210,000 people uh, going in the same direction, one plan, one team, one vision, one McDonald's. What makes this a little, little more interesting is that he's a new CEO, and his plan, his vision may not be the same exactly as the old CEO. So the first thing he's got to do is explain to him how, how it may differ and what it is so that they can get that's on board. That, this is not easy. Yes, that's right. That's right. This is a particularly challenging transition as far as CEO transitions go because his boss was fired on Friday, quite suddenly, as opposed to some companies where it's a much more orderly transition mm -hmm. where there's CEO succession planning and maybe a year of uh, the person being the COO before they get the CEO job. But this happened over the weekend. And so he has to gracefully um, uh, recognize uh, Easterbrook's role um, without really throwing him under the bus in light of what happened, but yet uh, be able to distance himself from it and uh, articulate a new plan and a new vision and get people on board with that. And so it's a quite of a trick as far as CEO transitions go. It's one of the more complicated ones for sure. Yeah, and he's got to be uh, distant from uh, what his predecessor, what Easterbrook was doing in terms of relationships with staff. Uh, so that uh, he's not blamed for the same mindset as Easterbrook was having. Uh, so he's well, going to be, and, and he's probably selected to be just a little distant. So he's not, you know, best buddies with Easterbrook. Well, that's right. And if you if you uh, spend some time on Twitter, which I did to prepare for our meeting tonight, uh, you'll see lots of um, posts on Twitter uh, complaining about sexual harassment claims uh, made by McDonald's employees or. Um, the the crew that works in the actual restaurants that they claim have been ignored. So now the company's faced a little bit with having to have a, a bit of a double standard of taking action on Easterbrook, but maybe not taking action on some of the claims that have come from other employees. And, you know, it's important that we don't speak with forked tongue. Yeah, that's right. and what's, uh, the lesson here is that once you raise the subject, the prospect of it on, uh, in a corporation like that, it's going to draw attention even if you fire the CEO, now you're in the limelight. That's right. And uh, Kamchinsky has to be above reproach, mm -hmm. for sure. So your advice then, let's assume we're all at the table, you, me, and Klepinski, and we're all sitting around, we're, we're drinking a fine Chablis. What's your advice? Well, certainly um, he's got to build his team at the top. So some of these people, let's think about this, on Friday, the people around that table were his peers, and now he's their boss. So he's got to be able to win them over. Perhaps some of them were aspiring to be the CEO and maybe feel passed over. And so he's got to be able to assess that and quickly build a new executive team at the top because a fragmented executive team will never create an aligned company. So he's got to start there. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, he's got he's got to be able to articulate a vision for McDonald's that inspires people that might be a, a 10 year vision. Let's talk about the year 20, 2030. Mm -hmm. Where are we going as a team and how are we going to create an environment where we all win in this new creating this new one McDonald's? Well, you always have the possibility that somebody on that team, the one he inherits, um, is not a good player and is going to pull negative. Uh, doesn't like it that he was selected, doesn't like his style, uh, was a little concerned that that person himself wasn't selected 
or her so. And so you, you may have people that, that are not really playing, playing on the team. And I've heard of many corporate situations, I'm sure you have too, is when the new CEO ascends, he changes that team around. He gets rid of the people he is worried about and gets new people. And I've heard of one that just, just changed their positions. Musical jobs changed everybody around the table so that he had control. In that case, it was a she. So she had control of everything. And they, were, you know, they weren't able to retrench themselves in the old way. It had to be something new, new challenges for everybody. Uh, yeah. what, is he, what, is, uh, what does uh, Kotemkin have to do about that? Well, he, he does have to do that assessment about whether everybody's on board with them. You know, the classic illustration of alignment is like the eight-person crew boat where everybody's rowing in per perfect synchronous harmony. But, you know, sometimes what's happened is it's like an eight-person boat with seven people in it or with one person who's rowing in the other direction. And so he's got to be able to figure out if there's anybody in the boat on the executive team that's rowing in the wrong direction, and he's got to move them out quickly um, and bring in the people uh, that really are uh, on, aligned with him, that buy into his vision, that buy into his leadership style and uh, want to be on board with the new McDonald's. And, you know, this is tricky because you're going to have to move some people out, and that's hard. Well, then now you assume you're satisfied with your, your team. Assume you've communicated your vision, uh, not only them, but the, the 213,000 uh, McDonald's employees who are involved. Uh, there's always the follow-through, because people are watching for the follow-through. They want to see that you will do what you said you were going to do, and there won't be any hesitation about it. How does he achieve that? What's your advice on effectuating the alignment? Well, he has to, he has to be able to articulate the plan in a way that's uh, simple enough that everybody can understand it. When Alan Mulally came into Ford, he created a, a one-page, one Ford plan. Matter of fact, it was so simple, he could put it on the back of everybody's business card. And uh, I think that there's something to be said for, especially in an organization like McDonald's that is so... Uh, globally distributed, to be able to communicate that plan simply. And so everybody in the company knows exactly what the priorities are, th what the plan is, and how they fit in that plan. And mm. so he's got to develop that, communicate it clearly, get everybody on board. And then, of course, as you mentioned, you have to execute because it, it doesn't do you any good to have a plan that you can't execute. And, um, you know, Wall Street's going to be watching very carefully to see whether he's able to deliver results, especially here in the short term. And with the new team, he's probably going to have to find the people who are most reliable in terms of executing that plan, uh, sort of a brain trust, don't you think, within, within the team? And that may be different than the brain trust that existed under Easterbrook before. Uh, what's the process there, and how important is that in terms of implementing the plan that he comes up with? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that McDonald's has to change. They've been losing uh, guests. I, I read one report that said over a half a million people had stopped going to McDonald's. Mm. And uh, they're struggling to reinvent themselves with a new, uh, fresher, uh, more contemporary menu. And that means change. That means not only the employees are going to have to change, but all of the franchisees are going to have to change. So, and these franchisees, you know, they, uh, they, uh, they have a different relationship with the company than an employee does. Because they, they've invested their own money, they bought this franchise, they have an operating agreement, and uh, he's got to be able to win over the franchisees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the good news is he spent the last couple of years running U.S. operations, um, so he knows the, the major players. But clearly he's got to you know, be able to convince them to make the changes that are required. Dave, we're going to take a short break. That's uh, Dave Ramos. When we come back for this, from this break, uh, we'd like to talk about uh, another aspect of this. Um, how do the lessons of alignment and um, the, the kind of um, recreating management and management style apply across the board in preserving, you know, the United States as number one economic power in the world? And, of course, vis-a-vis -vis government, which is also, you know, heavily dependent on good management. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii, 
We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with Dave Ramos, and we're talking about management. Uh, we're talking about uh, advising on alignment issues for McDonald's new CEO. But we're also we're taking the lessons of that advice and trying, at least in this part of the show, uh, to see how they apply those lessons uh, for the, a new generation of managers, if you will, around the country, so as to preserve its position globally as a leading uh, economic um, power. And then I also want to ask you, Dave, fair warning about how that applies in government, where leadership is so important. So let's talk about these entrepreneurs. Let's talk about these relatively young people who are coming out of business schools, who are coming out of MBAs, who are, who are coming out of, um, you know, entrepreneurial situations with great ideas. And now all of a sudden, they have a big staff, they have a lot of people, they have a lot of issues, uh, and they need to act like real managers to preserve the company, to get capital from Wall Street or, or from their parents, as the case may be. Um, you know, what are you, what are you advising them? Well, one of the things uh, we learned in all of our research, Jay, uh, is that uh, alignment applies in every setting, whether you're a small company, like I said, maybe 10 employees, all the way up to government. And so for the entrepreneur, my advice would be to build alignment into the fabric of the company from day one. Because what you want to avoid is allowing the company to grow and become siloed and uh, divided. Um, because it's much harder to realign a company once it's become divided than it is to build alignment in from day one. And so that's the best advice I can give people, the, the, uh, especially the entrepreneurs. They have to be aligned with their customers and then they have to be able to articulate that customer vision to their employees and stay externally aligned and internally aligned and don't get fragmented because it's really difficult to fix. Well, yeah, and uh, you know, I just wonder what happens when, um, when the manager we're talking um, you know, has trouble doing that, where he finds that people are pulling in another direction, uh, that his staff doesn't really get it, that things are fragmented, uh, and he's got to do correction, you know? It's like training my, my favorite puppy to do the thing. Sometimes you have to correct my puppy if you want her to really learn uh, how to be aligned with the rest of the family. Uh, so what do you do when you find that your puppy is not buying it? Well, I, I like to say there's three roles that that person has. First, they have to be a leader. They have to articulate a vision of the future and a sense of direction of where we're going. They have to be a manager. It means that they have to manage budgets, they have to manage projects, they have to manage deliverables, and they have to operate uh, as a, a hands-on manager when required. And they need to be a coach. They need to be able to come along that so, um, aside that employee who might be struggling and help them and coach them and help them uh, understand where they uh, uh, fit into the plan better. Because I found that if you, if at the top, we have people that are leading, managing, and coaching, that's the winning formula. Mm -hmm. You know, it reminds me of Nathan Hale, you know, the price of liberty, is et the price of business success is eternal vigilance. So I think inherent in what you said is you have to be fully aware as a manager of, of how things are going and whether people are, um, you know, on the plan, uh, aligned with the plan, or whether they're, you know, off and yon uh, in their own silos. Uh, you can't correct them unless you find out they need correction, am I right? That's correct. And one of the things that uh, is also happening now is people are using technology to help improve alignment. 
specifically things like goal alignment software, where the corporate goals and the divisional goals and the departmental goals down to each individual person's goals are publicly visible, creating this culture of transparency where I can see all of my coworkers' goals and they can see mine. This has uh, been proven to really help uh, people stay aligned because when they can see their own job and their coworkers' jobs and their boss's jobs and everyone's goals and how they all fit together, it makes it easier for them to stay aligned. Yeah, sure. Transparency so everybody knows what's happening. I recall when I That's first right. started practicing law, my firm would have meetings with all the associates and we would compare notes on productivity and hours billed and all that. And at first, you know, for all of us, it was hard because uh, you put yourself, you put, you know, you put yourself on the table for inspection and sometimes you would not do the way you wanted to do. Sometimes you would be embarrassed. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, uh, I come away with that with the lesson that it was positive. It was a positive experience. That transparency helped me understand how the firm in general worked. You know, I think it's yeah. the same thing. That's right. But it can't, see, it can't be punitive. The, the, the goal isn't to punish people who are falling behind, per se. We're, we're, our goal is to coach people so they catch up mm -hmm. and to learn the lessons from the people that are over delivering so that we can all apply those lessons and best practices. So I think it's the nuance of having that transparency not be punitive that makes it work. Right. And to excite them with the notion of change, because change is exciting. It's productive. It takes us to new and better places, presumably. And, and that takes me to my last question for you, actually, Dave. Government, okay? I think yeah. one, of the, one, of the reason, one of the phenomena that we have in this country is that people are not confident of government. Uh, they, somewhere along the line, who knows when exactly, they have lost confidence in government. Uh, they don't see government as part of them or them as part of government. Um, and so management of government is, is a, you know, it's a confidence crisis, as far as I can see. And the question is, do these principles apply to achieve good management in government? And, and uh, you know, how would you change, for example, any of the advice you would give to uh, Clem, uh, Clem, Clem, Clemtic, Clem, the new CEO of McDonald's? Yes. How would you change Kemchinsky. that? Say again? Kemchinsky. Kemchinsky. How would you... How would you, yes, how would you, how would you change the advice that we're talking about for McDonald's and for other, you know, business enterprises in the United States uh, when you're talking now about government instead? Well, I'm here in the Washington, D.C. area, so government's right here in my backyard. And tonight's election night, so there's a lot going on. The polls are, you know, just closing, and so we look forward to seeing what the results are. But government has some systemic challenges that businesses don't. Uh, for example, the coexistence of long-term uh, bureaucrat employees and political appointees, those who and the political appointees come in and out every four to eight years to change the direction. And so this creates a systemic uh, extra challenge that government has that the businesses don't have. Uh, in government, uh, it's very difficult uh, to let people go uh, for performance or being out of alignment or whatnot. Uh, which creates additional uh, difficulty. And I think ultimately um, we need to remember the first principles of E Pluribus Unum, that uh, we, we were founded as this great experiment to be one country out of many coming together as one. And I think we've lost the, the sense of wonder and awe about that idea. And I, I think it's time to put that front and center first. And that says at the end of the day, we have to be one country and we have to work together as one uh, citizenry to make the country better and not let the divisions become so caustic and divisive that they tear our society and our fabric apart. Yeah, that, well, that's just an extension of the same thing, isn't it? Alignment, all on the same page yeah. and the basic uh, principles yeah. of, of, of how we live together. Um, I have yes. one more, I have one more question for you and that is uh, you've written a book and I believe it covers some of these points. Can you identify yeah. the book and tell us about it and, and how we can get a copy? Well, the book's called Drive One Direction, How to Unleash the Accelerating Power of Alignment. It's available on Amazon. I spent uh, about 10 years. I studied 300 companies. I interviewed uh, 100 CEOs. And the book has 50 case studies of exemplar companies of how they created alignment. 
uh, companies like Amazon and Ford and Tesla and Netflix uh, and USAA and, and small companies as well, like Bognet Construction or BTI 360 that are small companies uh, using the same principles. And so um, Drive One Direction, available on Amazon, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Sure. Thank you. Dave Ramos, really appreciate it. Great to meet you. Great to have Great. this conversation. I hope we can continue it at some point in the future. Let's do it again, Jay. Okay. Aloha, Dave. Aloha. <laughs>